Alan, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Doug. Thank you so much for having me back again. I'm excited to dive in with you, man, because I know you came on the first time. You shared a little bit about your story, your struggle with um, alcohol addiction, and we talked a lot about like health and wellness and nutrition and science-based tools for people to be able to help themselves on that on that side of things. But I wanted to bring you back on here and talk about mental health because I know you're passionate about mental health. I know mental health and physical health goes hand in hand. So based on your understanding of the science, based on your own experience, like how, like, why do you believe that they're so intertwined mental health and physical health? In terms of, of just general health, there's really unlimited connections to mental health and, and physical health, because it's like, if you are not motivated to physically move, if you're not motivated to be mobile, get out of bed. Um, go to the gym or just do your exercise training routine, then that is the beginning of the end for you right there. Right? People who just literally sit around, you know, the tendency is to make that sitting around a little more tolerable or more meaningful and then substances can creep in. And then there you have a, a recipe for disaster at a, like a fast track hand basket toward hell right there. So um, being in good physical health and good physical shape, and then you know you can take it to the level of having good physical fitness, that just kind of has this reciprocal relationship with um, good mental health. And I think a lot of times what happens is, is people when they're in dire straits or they are like depressed or they're super stressed, they have a hard time like getting off the couch, they have a hard time actually making it to the gym because their energy is low. They feel ashamed, whatever the case may be. Um, like, what advice do you have for somebody, or what are some what are some what are some strategies that you've even used in your own journey when you're not you're feeling kind of low to be able to at least get yourself out the door? I think a lot of it just begins with taking the first step. If you notice that you have a tough time getting out of bed when you when you need to get out of bed then look immediately towards what kind of sleep hygiene do you have like let's take a look at your sleep routine you know are are you winding down are you giving yourself enough time to to wind down to be asleep in order to get those 7 hours plus and there's always going to be debate over an optimal amount of sleep, but the seven hour threshold seems to be uh, the most common, the most common one where below that point, then you start courting um, adverse outcomes health wise. So look at sleep hygiene first, get that straight, any which way but loose. If you feel like it takes you two hours to fall asleep, then you're going to need to go to bed. You're going to need to be in that bed two hours before you need to be asleep. You know what I mean? Um, if you need to put your phone in another room uh, when you go to bed and go to sleep, otherwise you're just going to reach over to the night table, and grab it and check the comments, then um, you need to keep that phone away because you need to get some sleep. So I think sleep hygiene is, is really important. It's a, It's an important first step. And it takes uh, some practice and it takes some discipline and it, it takes the, the, the ego pain of, of failing your way through getting that routine right. And that's something that I still work on is the, the whole sleep. Uh, and somebody who's, uh, you know, still trying to try to set the world on fire. <laughs> um, sleep is something that sometimes gets uh, deprioritized. And so, okay, so if you get that part right, then you actually have the energy reserve to say, okay, I'm going to take the first step, which is going through that exercise routine, just taking the first step and doing what I can realistically do. You can't right out the gate say, you know, it's time to just start training Monday through Friday with this perfectly periodized plan where the reps uh, in the work sets are taken to, you know, an RPE nine or one, one rep in reserve, you know, for this, this perfect, this perfection of eight to 16 
working sets per week. And then, you know, I got my strength block. I got my hypertrophy block and I mix it in with the metabolic conditioning blocks. And I'm just going to do that. Bam. You know, it's like, no, you do what you can do and you be consistent with it and you move up in increments as slash if needed. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. And I know that like sleep is so important and it's at the foundation of everything. And then you have to take incremental steps in your fitness routine. Like once you're able to um, establish some good um, sleep hygiene, there's a lot of modalities and tools that people talk about with regards to in the fitness um, space, as far as like improve things you can do to improve your mental health. You'll hear some people say that you have to strength train for your mental health. You'll hear some people say you get the endorphin rush, your runner's high from running. You'll hear, you'll hear some people say that you got to do like yoga or whatever. Like what have you found based on research that you come across is like some of the non-negotiables from a fitness perspective in, in order to improve your mental health? It's individual. Some people hit their nirvana pushing and pulling weights. And some people hit their, their, uh, point of um, euphoria where they're, they get in the zone and they find that, okay, well, possibly there, there's some endorphin release. There's some, you know, endogenous opioid <laughs> production <laughs> when they're doing endurance type of work. And some people get a certain feeling out of just being outside and, and uh, being in nature, taking a, a, a relaxing stroll and so all of those things are legit you know whether you're going hard in the gym with some some uh you know metallica in your ears or something better than than metallica because they really kind of sucked since after the black album um or whether you're somebody who goes and does yoga by yourself or or in a group it's highly individualized. People just have things that happen in their lives and their just their life experiences and the way that they uh, respond to environment that gives them the personal preference of, of going with any one of those activities. And, and so I, I don't think you can make a universal prescription for what would be best or what would be ideal exercise for mental health. Right. Yeah. I mean, it just all comes back to like what works best for the individual because that's going to be what people will actually end up sticking to long-term. Don't you see this problem that kind of exists now where people almost sacrifice their mental health for the sake of being healthy? And what I mean by that is that they try to like reach like this level of perfection in their nutrition and their fitness routine. They try to do everything. They almost like eliminate nearly everything from their life so that they can like live this perfect, so-called perfect, healthy lifestyle. I mean, do you, do you, do you see that as well? And what problems does that present? And how could people have a more health, like a healthier relationship with that? Yeah, I think that that, I mean, it's unfortunately it's hard to avoid in the fitness industry because you want to be healthier. That that's a noble objective. You want to, in quotes, optimize your health and your routine and, but you know, this extends to, okay, I want to optimize my food selection. I want to optimize my exercise selection. Um, I want to, you, you go from wanting to optimize to, okay, I, what is the absolute perfect way that I can live? And then you start increasing these degrees of obsessiveness and that's where it can kind of go wrong with certain individuals who have that tendency to take that obsession too far i mean you, you know you listen to business gurus and stuff no then they'll, they'll be like yeah well if you're if you're not obsessed you're just freaking lazy <laughs> and i get that man you know i get that I, I i kind of i love the obsession with wanting to achieve whether it's health or fitness or um, career related stuff. I, I love that stuff. But the fact of the matter is a lot of individuals who, who take that approach end up obsessing to the, to the point that they combine their obsessions with 
a, I guess, a lack of um, education of the, the downsides of, of taking things too far. Like, for example, you know, the term orthorexia. Yeah, so that was me for a while. Yeah, orthorexia is um, an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. And uh, it's characterized by uh, people kind of walking the line between um, eating judiciously versus incurring an eating disorder that looks somewhat like anorexia. And so there, there's kind of a, a convergence of pathologies there that, that orthorexia combines with sometimes um, under eating and overactivity. And then the cycle just kind of viciously interact. And then the person ends up in a place where, oh, wow, I've got a full blown eating disorder. And so I think that as long as people can live their lives and go through their nutrition and exercise routines with the attitude that, you know what, doing this 80%, 90% possibly percent, just subjectively, you know, not necessarily just keeping a calculator and tabs on everything. I can still live a healthy life. And um, I think it's important for people to realize that um, we humans are pre-programmed to die at some point. You know, we're not actually immortal beings. And a lot of people wouldn't necessarily want to live to 150. Um, you know, <laughs> so uh, I think that it's it's important to to realize that hey statistically on average we'll we'll make it into 80ish low 80s you know in in some pockets but uh if we can put more life in those years if we can make it more meaningful and we can spend a little bit less time micromanaging and obsessing over over details that may or may not matter then you end up having a better life while you're around how can somebody if they're in this position where they're like so hyper focused on eating healthy and these lifestyle choices, how can they take a step back in a healthy way without like falling into this trap where you're like, well, I guess I'm just not being as healthy or I should be able to do better or why can't I have a healthy relationship with food? Like, how can somebody begin to like have a better approach with that? Um, I would say just do stuff and live life. Some people are, some people really enjoy staying ultra fit and, and ultra active. And that, that's cool. That's, you know, that's more power to them. And people have different psychological tolerances for training, let's say six days a week versus training three days a week. But I, I would say that go out and do stuff, try um, different life activities, try different life adventures see how you respond to them, see how you like. A lot of times it opens up people's mind to just go somewhere they've never been before, eat some food they've never eaten before, and do some fun things they've, they've never done before. And then they realize, oh gosh, I've been obsessing over how many grams of fiber I get a day as my main thought. And instead of, you know, thinking about how can I feel fulfilled in the sense of gaining experiences. Yeah. Experiences are so important. And I think along these same lines, and I know this is something that, that you do is you kind of try to help, um, educate people on what's fact and what's fiction and help, um, bust through some of these myths that people tend to believe. How can somebody with so much information out there and people posting videos about certain things that are terrible for you or demonizing this and that, how can the average person learn to navigate through all that information to find out like what's legitimate or what's not if they don't have time to like you know read into a dive into a research paper you just kind of have to either have the skills and the scientific literacy to do do the work yourself or you have to kind of know who you have to know who knows what in what in what area you know um and and people span the gamut from autodidactic to I got to go and take a course. So the autodidacts or the self-taught people can just read a bunch of books 
and read a bunch of uh, literature and then gain the skills of scientific or science literacy. But it's a pain in the butt, honestly. And so in the, in the world of uh, nutrition and exercise, there's a handful of, of experts worth listening to. And the experts that you do want to listen to are, are the, the safe bet are the science-based, the evidence-based experts. Um, so that, that is always a hard question, Doug, when, when somebody asks, you know, how do you navigate the minefield of, of misinformation out there in the health and fitness realm? Uh, and it kind of comes down to knowing who the go-to experts are in each department. Like, for example, if I wanted to learn how to, how to put muscle, I want to put muscle on it. Who do I go to? Okay. You go to the most prolific researchers in that area. And then you go to the ones who do the research and who have done the gym time as well, right? You, you don't necessarily want to follow somebody who just talks the talk, but doesn't walk the walk. So one of the first people who comes to mind for, I, I want to learn about mus muscle growth. How do I do it? How do I program for it? What's the problem? All that. Who, who's, who's the first guy you think of? The first researcher you think of? Me? Yeah. I mean, there's a, I mean, there's, there's three that come up to mind. Can I name three? Name them. I would say, I would say Andy Galpin, hmm? Brad Schoenfield, and, and Lane, probably. Great. Those guys are awesome resources. Those guys are authorities in their departments and uh, they walk the walk the talk. It's hard to fail when you know the right folks. So like with it, it's almost like making it in Hollywood. <laughs> it's like it's about who you know. <laughs> so if you want to gain knowledge, you kind of have to know who who has the knowledge. And and I'm not knocking once again, I'm not knocking people who want to just go through the degrees and, and, you know, get the certifications and, and do that. You should, you should put some effort towards that anyway, if you have the time and the resources and that, that's your, you know, that the formal education, it fits your psychographic. Uh, but in the training department, you name some great resources in the nutrition department, name three guys, three guys who have it figured out and are, are doing good work and, putting out the evidence-based stuff in the nutrition department. Well, I was, I was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to loop in a couple of names that are, I think, evidence-based. And also there's a lot of nuance to what they say. So it's, it's, I think a lot of people can relate to them. I would say you, um, Lane, I, I mean, Max. I think Max is very nuanced in his approach to nutrition. Um, Simon. I mean, I know Simon is, you know, he, he's predominantly he's, he's plant based, but I think he puts out some good information. And when you when you talk to him, he's very nuanced in what he says. Um, so yeah, you, Lane, Simon, Max, I'm trying. To, I think I think those are just four great um, starting points for me. Yeah, no, that that is real. See, that's where it's at. Because you get like, a, you get a mix of everything, right? Because mm -hmm. then it's. You get a mix of everything. You get people who disagree on things. You get people who agree on certain things and you get to hear different perspectives. And I think that's part of the problem in the nutrition space is like these echo chambers get created and nobody's able to have a nuanced conversation. You're able to kind of like learn from different people. Like I learned from all of you guys based on what you post and you guys have changed my perspectives on different things. Right. I mean, and so I think it's important just to not like idolize one person, right? But to more or less get good information from people that you trust and, you know, take it, take each person's advice and see where you can apply like little bits and pieces into your life and not necessarily model everything they say into your life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's important. You bring up a good point that you can have your in quotes heroes in in the field and, and your authority figures, but it's really important to have enough discipline to not just take everything everybody says on faith because, Hey, you know, we're, we're wrong sometimes too. And, um, the, 
gray areas in our knowledge are, in everybody's knowledge, is pretty vast, and that's why research continues. You know, there there's a body of knowledge that is pretty static in terms of um, fitness goals, like in terms of gaining size and strength, in terms of fat loss in terms of um, increasing athletic performance and stuff like that. Um, so a, a lot of that stuff doesn't change. And a lot of that stuff, we're just kind of refining the existing knowledge base of. But um, there are things that, that um, the people at the, at the research level are, are wrong about. There are things that we look back five, 10 years and go, yeah, you know, I, I was wrong about that. And so I do think it's important. To be able to follow folks who don't necessarily have the exact same philosophy, you know, um, you talk, you brought up, brought up Simon. Simon's a vegan for crying out loud, and uh, but you can still have a reasonable conversation with him, which is really cool, and which I I appreciate that about Simon, and he's kind of a bro deep down too. Yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> Like the, the question that you threw out there, I'm really, really tempted to say, look, there are a few research reviews out there in the space, which I pioneered the model. And so definitely hop on um, my research review if you're interested in a nutrition bent. And uh, there are various other research reviews out there. But if you have the patience and the nerve and you like to read, then I would point people to my research review for just to, just to answer that question. So I guess outside of like how notable some of these people are and obviously looking at their, their background, is there certain things that somebody might say that people should pay attention to? Because I think a lot of times people will say, oh, this person has like, you know, 3 million followers or they have 700,000 followers and they look like they're in shape. So they must know what they're talking about. And if they start saying that seed oils are bad, if they start saying that X thing is bad, that, oh my gosh, I got to cut out seed oils. I got to cut out meat. I got to cut out dairy. I'm just going to eat, you know, grass fed beef and, or grass fed um, chicken and green beans all day. And then you know, that life gets really boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, there's common threads among people who, you know, who, who raise red flags, anybody who demonizes, a, a let's say a, an entire macronutrient. Um, there was, a there was almost like a, a, a cult of folks and they, uh, oh, there's only a few of them left, <laughs> but they were low fat, uh, plant-based. So strictly like you can't, you got to keep fat very low. That was that was a thing for a while. Yeah, they they, they were anti-fat folks, and they they would even make claims like uh, even olive oil is, is bad for you. You know, don't don't you don't don't add any oil to your diet and all that stuff. And I believe their their messiah was uh, Esselstyn or Esselstein, that being uh, one of the researchers of a few generations back, who had these kind of wild conclusions that sort of propagated and created this faction of people who just felt that dietary fat was bad and you should just never be eating oil, which is insane, of course. And then you have people who uniformly demonize carbohydrate. Like that's a red flag too. Um, only because like it, and I immediately immediately think of the carnivore uh, group, but the there are folks in the carnivore camp who are more reasonable than others, and you know, believe it or not, the the head guy at the top of the pyramid, Sean Baker. I've spoken with him, and he's he's said, "Hey, this is something to try. This is something to try when." You're trying to um, figure out wh what's giving you these adverse symptoms. You're trying to figure out um, what's causing these these uh, these potential like intolerances with with foods. And so, just you need to try try the meat based diet, and you don't have to be 
totally militant or strict about it. You know, you like dairy, add, add dairy in there too, but just, just give it a try for at least a few months and see, see what happens. And seriously, man, like I'm, I'm fine with that. It's when people say, Hey, look, this is the best way. Carbohydrates are the devil. Uh, and so, uh, and they're the devil because X, Y, and Z reason that's just a, a mishmash of imagination and pseudoscience. Um, that's, that's when I have an issue with it. And so, um, moving on to the final macronutrient protein, when somebody says protein's going to kill you, man, protein's going to melt your liver and, and your kidneys. And so therefore, you know, you gotta, you gotta eat the RDA for protein at all times, like no matter what life stage, no matter what your goal is, you got to keep protein low because, you know, protein, it, it antagonizes uh, longevity too. And all this stuff, it's like, no, that's another red flag. So that kind of falls all under the umbrella of demonizing a, a, an entire macronutrient. That's a red flag. Um, another big red flag is when you ask for evidence from somebody, like, let's say they're making these wild, wild claims, like, uh, adrenal fatigue this or insulin that um and then you just go all right let's can we see the evidence basis can we discuss the evidence basis here let's let's put the research on the table and on and a lot of times you can avoid a lot of wasted time by asking for human research on on this particular claim or this protocol so let's take a look at the human research and see how interesting or compelling it is. Let's see what the strengths and limitations are because research is really only as good as its relevance to the question or its relevance to the population at hand. And so there's going to be variations in that, that level of relevance there with research when you discuss it. But a lot of times when you ask somebody, hey, can you send me the human research for what you're saying? Then they won't and can't do it. And you'll see that right now in a post I did about, uh, well, it was a collaboration post with Tony Coffey um, about uh, talking about canola oil. And uh, it's, oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. comment section is, is really a firestorm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot of it is just people who are a little more educated on the approach to ev evidence and, and science and research asking people for evidence and then crickets happening. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, it's a fun topic. I want to talk about funding uh, for a second, because you'll hear like the devil's advocate to some of this stuff. They'll say, there's people now saying that they're, the food industry is corrupt and they essentially fund all these papers. And so it's makes the, the research kind of tainted in a way. Um, like what's your response when, when people say stuff like that? My first response is that are you dismissing all industry research, industry funded research, or are you cherry picking the industry research that aligns with your pre-existent beliefs and rejecting any industry research that doesn't align with your pre-existing beliefs? So that's, that's the first thing I would do is point out that dismissing research on the basis of funding source is a bias in and of itself because research for the most part is very expensive. Somebody's got to pay for it. Somebody's got to pony up the funds, whether it's from private industry or private individuals, or whether it's from government entities that can, you know, extract those funds and assemble those funds and put the research to work. The money's got to come from somewhere. And that that's my my big thing it's it's like and if somebody says yeah i reject all industry research then basically the conversation is done and it's over with but when you ask them okay and and i'll give you an example like when somebody says oh well hey this research here like funded by by the the grain industry okay so therefore you can kick it out and, and that's why you can't trust any of this stuff. It's funded by big ag, big agriculture. And at the same time, you can ask this person, all right, so 
this research right here showing that eggs cause this or that favorable effect, okay? Or meat uh, causes this or that favorable effect that you're leaning on this research. Are you willing to reject that research as well because it's funded by big meat or big egg to defend your anti-grain stance? Are you willing to just say, uh, we're, cut, cut that out too? And then people realize how ridiculous they're being when they're dismissing industry-funded research. And then the coup de gras is when um, you ask folks, all right, so you're ripping on industry funding. Have you ever been involved with research at all? Like, are you familiar with the process of getting funding and how the sponsor is or isn't involved in the research? And of course, you know, of course the answer is no. And then you can share well, I can share a, a personal story about industry funding where uh, diamondized nutrition, a supplement industry, right? Yep. So um, I remember that. They, they used to take their supplements back. It was a protein powder, right? Yeah, diamondized elite. Elite. Yeah, that's, yep. that's still good stuff, man. So, so diamondized funded a meta analysis that uh, I did with Brad and James, Brad Schoenfeld and James Krieger. And uh, what, we, what we found, the results, were contrary to what a supplement company would want to see. So we did a meta-analysis, which is an examination or an analysis of several studies, looking at effect sizes and determining whether protein timing makes much of a difference in terms of gains in muscle size and strength. And for the most part, we found that as long as your total daily protein is at a certain level, 1.6, 1.7 and up grams per kilogram, then the timing next to the training bout within a couple hours either side has no effect. And so um, obviously a, a company like Dimatize would naturally love to hear that there are these very sensitive effects of protein timing relative to training that would augment adaptations so that would augment uh, gains in muscle size and strength. But we didn't find that. But here's the thing. Um, there was what we, we call an a priori agreement. So there is a predetermined agreement between the researchers and the funding entity that, hey, we are doing science, meaning we are going to set up the experiment and see where the data leads, right? Um, of course, with, with meta-analyses, it's, it's a little different. It's more like, it's more like secondary research where, where you're assembling, um, where, where you're putting, pooling data together and seeing where, where it leads, right? Um, so we had a, a, a pre-existent agreement that Dimatize would fund the research, but have no involvement whatsoever in the actual execution, interpretation, and publication of the work. So it's hands off. And so it's kind of a beautiful thing. That's, that's, how, that's how science works. You know, when, when everything is done right, commercial bias is suppressed. Now, I'm not saying that commercial bias doesn't exist in research, but the best thing we could possibly do is judge the science and not the funding source because judging the funding source is a bias in and of itself. And really who you're judging when you judge the funding source is you're judging the, the researchers. You're judging the scientists. These poor saps are not paid much at all to do this stuff, man. We do this for the love. We, we do this for, we literally do this for less. There's no freaking money in, in, in doing this work. So, um, yeah, it's really silly when, when somebody points to, to, oh, yeah, this was funded by this or this was funded by that. Yeah. It's my soapbox. Yeah. So, so staying on this topic and kind of marrying these last two talking points together, other than seed oils, what are some common myths that you see on social media I think we, we talked about insulin in the last episode, so we don't have to talk about that one because I know that you're passionate about that subject as well. What are some other myths out there that you think that 
um, people tend to fall into that are just flat out not true. Oh gosh, it's sometimes there. There's uh, there's so many that it's hard to it's hard to pick one. <laughs> I I think that there's some odd things going on with uh, cold water immersion. Um, and the odd thing is that people are are just they've convinced themselves that they're getting this this special hormetic effect that's going to add many years to their lives and, and, and improve their immunity and all kinds of hopes and, and, and dreams when a lot of this stuff is a maybe. And some of this stuff actually antagonizes goals that contribute to longevity. Like, for example, um, cold water immersion post-exercise inhibits the, the anabolic process at the, at the muscle level. So if somebody wanted to maximally either preserve muscle or cause a maximal rate of muscle growth, then you're going to be throwing a monkey wrench in there with cold water immersion. Um, now... I'll give I'll give people this that some people get a a a rush if you will out of cold water immersion and uh, just getting in an ice bath it, it makes them it, it makes them feel like they're doing something that's hard to do and it's building mental toughness. Uh, okay, I'm okay, I'm okay with that. That that's fine. Um, but you have to realize that you're striking a compromise between the goal of, let's say, building mental toughness and the goal of optimizing your rate of muscle growth. And so um, as long as we're, we can agree on that compromise is happening, then I'm okay with it. Do you think that your people are, do you think it can become like obsessive though, if people are saying, well, I want to maximize my muscle gain, so I'm not going to do cold water. Like, is the decrease in muscle growth like that substantial that, that, that it would actually really matter? It depends on the individual. You know, if, uh, if somebody needs to look a certain way by a certain time uh, and, and there's a, some time constraint there, then it could be an issue. Um, if, somebody, if somebody is a bodybuilder, let's say, um, and yeah, like some people bring up the fact that Chris Bumstead, he, he does cold water immersions. And so who, who are you to talk about cold water immersion? You know, sebum will, will destroy you. But yes, of course. I mean, but hey, maybe, maybe sebum could be even better. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all on, it's all on an individual goal basis. Um, people have their rituals that they like, but the problem is when they start building these massive claims around their favorite rituals and saying that everybody needs to do it. So that's when, that's when the issue comes in because there's a certain beauty in, in saving yourself the time and the expense, sometimes the heartache of, of doing certain rituals that certain people like, but say that, Hey, everybody's got to do this. Otherwise you're not optimizing your health. Um, and, and when the evidence is not there to support those things, then sometimes, uh, you can increase your, your degrees of freedom of living your life when you can be a little more, uh, choosy about these things that you, you, uh, you do these in your routine. And I think it just goes back to some of what we've already talked about that you shouldn't like idolize a certain thing when it comes to your health and fitness you should just f try to find like how these things work within your lifestyle your day and that sort of thing i mean i've done cold water immersion um i don't do it every single day but my the biggest benefits that i found is it's just it's more like doing something that's challenging for me for mental toughness like kind of like what you said like i don't go into there and, and think that i'm gonna get i mean I, I don't know enough about the science to really understand it one way or the other but i'm not I'm going in there just to prove to myself that I can do something that sucks, right? And that I can just withstand it. And I have noticed, and this is totally my experience, so I can't say that this is 100% fact for everybody, that 
when I when I've done it, I feel more confident in other areas of my life. Now that could be totally placebo. I don't know. But I'm like, man, I just sat in a in a cold plunge for three minutes or four minutes when, you know, two months ago I could barely get in there with for ten seconds without screaming. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. and so I think there's I think there's that. Um what about inflammation? You see a lot of people talking about how food causes inflammation and that like certain things that you eat, you know, you just have inflammation, inflammation. What's your take on that? Well, I don't think that people understand like the significance of, of even the word inflammation, you know? And, and so I think that that that's kind of a buzzword that people automatically associate with negative stuff. So the idea that certain foods are inflammatory Hopefully we're, we're talking about chronic inflammation of the vascular tissues. And, uh, and hopefully we're talking about um, a measurable level of inflammation that we can objectively plot and identify that, okay, well, the levels of these inflammatory markers reliably go up to a clinically relevant degree from the consumption of this food at this dose because let's look at the food let's look at the dose let's look at the context so there was a big claim that dairy is inflammatory that, that that was a popular claim so people who dislike dairy for one reason or another and want to vilify milk and milk products for one reason or another that one of the big claims was that it's inflammatory and so a lot of research was was based on this claim and the kind of the cool thing about claims and myths and lore is it provides researchers with stuff to investigate so we can't get too mad at the woo woos and the you know the wild claims and stuff because it gives us aspects of reality to uncover so dairy and inflammation was one of them and that claim was so pervasive at one point that so much research was done on on this particular claim and almost all of it the overwhelming majority and i want to say almost 100 percent, shows that um dairy especially all, all dairy aside from let's say just dairy fat like butter <laughs> um i'm talking about full fat milk yogurt you know non-fat milk etc et, et all of that stuff shows either no effect on, on inflammation or an actual anti-inflammatory effect. And, and so that was an interesting eye opener that, oh, wow, this is, this is really interesting. The, all, almost the opposite of what we thought is actually the reality of the matter. And then there's other avenues of the inflammation topic to, that we can look at. Uh, Omega-6 fatty acids are kind of known as Okay, the, the evil the evil brother of omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids, for example, found in fish and certain line foods. Um, those are, are famously anti-inflammatory. And omega-6 fatty acids, linoleic acid in particular, is famously at, at, the, at the start of this inflammatory cascade that ends in arachidonic acid production. So at, at the sort of the micro level, the biochemical level, omega-6 fatty acids are, oh yeah, they're inflammatory. Okay, cool. Well, here's the, the big point. We don't eat isolated fatty acids. We eat foods and foods contain in quotes, a matrix of compounds that can alter the function and, and the health impacts of the food. So um, a classic example of a food that has high omega-6 levels, but has neutral to beneficial effects on inflammation at the vascular level are nuts, any, any and all kinds of nuts. Um, Anti-inflammatory, uh, good for health, good for cardiovascular health improve blood lipids, Im improve blood glucose control, improve all kinds of aspects of cardiometabolic health, but, oh man, they've got them omega-6s in them. Why is that? Oh, it's because a food is more than the fatty acids it contains. 
there are there, there's a multitude of compounds that we're just completely overlooking as we're zeroing in on this type of fatty acid or that you know like this saturated fatty acid or this omega-6 fatty acid let's pan back let's look at the food source so if the food matrix is is kind of the is what ultimately matters unless you're going around eating isolated fatty acids which is not the case i mean it's so important to pay attention to the whole food right and that's like another thing that i actually learned from simon you know as far as like vegan protein and like the total protein intake and that you know you're not just going to eat like brown rice all day you're going to typically eat like a variety of foods and i know that like once you hit a and that you know opened my eyes to saying okay as long as you eat like a certain amount of those types of foods and you hit that protein target then you're good like where it matters more as far as like making sure that you're eating some animal protein is if you're not getting enough protein from those plant-based um sources so like i that really helps the entire picture when it comes to foods like you're not eating nutrients or eating a whole food I guess like the last thing I want to ask you when it comes to, to all of this is that you hear a lot that food can impact your mood, that you shouldn't, you know, speaking of insulin, you shouldn't spike your blood sugar because it can like impact your mood and, and that sort of thing. How important is food when it comes to your mental health? There's definitely a food and, and mood connection and uh, at kind of a, a crude level some people in the space have hypothesized that like for example if you if you cut out carbohydrates to low to no then your your mood will be impaired but the data on that is not consistent so um macro nutrition per se whether you're eating high carb low fat or high fat low carb or somewhere in between um the data are not strong to point to a, a specific paradigm for, for optimizing mood and, and mitigating things like depression and stuff. Um, so there's not really much to go on with that, with that part of diet and mood. But what we do have data on is a lack of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet and, uh, depression and symptoms of depression. So that is a relatively consistent finding. So if you, if you lack things like fatty fish in the diet, let's say you never consume it, or you never uh, consume alpha linolenic acid sources in the plant world, then you're not going to be getting nearly enough omega-3 in your diet. And then you could be predisposing yourself to not only mood disorders, but cognitive decline. Got it. So what I'm hearing you say is there's no consistent evidence to to people, you know, to food necessarily impacting mood per se. However, that the omega threes eating eating enough omega three is incredibly important for brain health, for cognitive function. Alan, I could spend hours talking to you about this stuff because I really, this really interests me and I'm really, I've learned a lot from, you know, from you and just even like the research stuff and the, the funding and stuff, which was eye opening as far as how that all works. So I wanted to thank you again for your time. I know people loved our first episode. They're going to want to follow you and check out your stuff if they haven't already. Um, where's the best place to do that? AlanAragon.com. That's the hub of all of my stuff. And I encourage folks to, if you if you're the type who would like to crack open a book, I think it's been a year now since I released my my latest book, Flexible Dieting, which is mistitled because it should be called Evidence Based Nutrition for um, Non Clinical Goals. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's you know, funny. Yeah, so so that's where I would point people to. And I'm, I'm going to do something hilarious and, and be obsessive myself and say that creatine also is piling up research on cognitive benefits. So if your diet lacks creatine and I'm looking at my vegan friends, then it, it, might, it might be worth supplementing your diet with creatine. 
but vegans are also missing out on a bunch of other things too. So, oh, well, <laughs> we're going to clip that. We're going to clip, we're going to, we're going to click, we're going to clip that. <laughs> What's up, Simon Hill? What's up, man? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's funny. Uh, it's always a good time with you, Alan. And for, uh, I will be sure to, I'll, to, to include the links to connect with you in the in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something we talked about um, regarding mental health. Maybe it was something we just recently talked about with the importance of eating omega-3s as far as mental health. Maybe it was something we talked about as far as how to identify who to, who to follow and who to listen to as far as advice in the health and wellness community. Maybe it was something that we talked about as far as research and funding, whatever the takeaway was, make sure to tag Alan and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.